Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on rethinking knowledge production in migration research, uh, brought to you by the Migration Policy Center at the European University Institute. And first of all, I would like to apologize on behalf of my colleague Leila, who, um, who couldn't be here because she's not feeling well, and she would have been the one chairing this session. Um, so I will now be chairing uh, the session in her place and we wish her a speedy recovery uh, uh, as well. Um, so this webin in this webinar, we'll be discussing uh, approaches that aim to overcome methodological nationalism and the, the Eurocentric system of knowledge production in migration studies. Uh, and this, this, this is really a response to some, some of the movement to, to, towards challenging po political narratives about the causes and effects of migration, as well as the characteristics of migration. And the policy world has, 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 has also been implicated in some, in some way by obviously having to think about conducting research on certain groups of people um, using certain concepts um, within the, the broader space of of migration studies. And in this sense, um, migration scholars are, are not necessarily just observers of migration, but they are knowledge producers about migration. And they also shape understandings about uh, these, these, these migration pr processes, which, which um, would lend some to, to argue that they can be viewed as migration uh, governance players alongside, alongside uh, others. So, with the so with the so-called um, European migration crisis, as well as movements towards Black Lives Matter, uh, and quite lately, I think with the Ukrainian um, refugee situation, that we've seen a lot of uh, question and reflection within migration scholarship about some of these concepts and categories and perspectives within the field, and thinking about why certain groups take, get. Um, Treated a certain way by by nation states and how they respond to migration and also how scholars frame these these migrants within their work um, and in the past years this um, um, reflexive turn has also been complemented with the rise in claims about a decolo decolonial approach which highlights the, ne the necess necessity on focusing on these processes that racialize migrants and also their continued continuities so we would like to contribute to these efforts of reflection through this webinar by discussing the uh, approaches that aim at least to overcome um, some of these challenges. So we are joined by um, Ma Martina Tazioli from Goldsmiths University, who is here to present on behalf of a co-author, St Stefan Schill. And we also are privileged to have uh, uh, Janine Dahinden from the University of Neuchatel, uh, who is also here to, to, to help us unpack some of these issues. And I, would, I will also be part of this panel and we'll all be putting in a 15 to 20 minute presentation. And all after that, we would then um, hand over for a Q&A. So the session is, is, is live and all you have to do on your side is to put up your questions in your in the chat box, and then we will come to them. So, in in, in opening, we're going to hand over to to Janine, whose um, initial presentation was has been titled "Addressing Complex Hegemonies, Power, and Reflexivities Within Migration Studies: Ways Forward," and it ends with a question mark. I believe uh, from from what she has informed me that this might this might have somewhat changed, but I don't think it's really it's a fundamental drift from what she would have wanted to address in this uh, in this conversation. So I will now hand over to you, Janine, uh, so that you can uh, open for us with, with your talk, and then um, we will take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Kuda. Thanks for this introduction and also thanks a lot for this invitation to this webinar. I have been very much looking forward to this. Unfortunately, I was also ill last days and I caught the flu while actually everyone else has COVID. But uh, that is that I didn't have actually time to prepare what I wanted to present, which would have been something really about categorization. 
I, what I would like to do today is actually that I will go back to a blog, which I wrote a couple of days ago, which is not yet published, but I would like to use this blog in order to think about knowledge production and reflexivity, but beyond academia. So what I will do is uh, something very topical. And this means that as all you have observed actually that since Putin's invasion of Ukraine on February 24, there are some things happening which are haunting us. I think most of us as migration scholars. And for me, there are two things which are haunting me. So first, what has been called this kind of unprecedented solidarity we can observe of European state and its people with refugees fleeing from Ukraine. But also, it also could have already mentioned it, this kind of double standard in view of other refugee groups from Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, or from African countries. And what I would like to do first is to show how these two observations are actually at least partially intertwined. And I would like to show how to demonstrate how this big solidarity is actually Janus faced in that it reinforces simultaneously these ideas about undeserving refugee others and creating unequal treatment. And afterwards, I would like to present some reflections on how do we deal as scholars with this kind of issues. So we, we write this kind of blogs, we, we talk uh, in television, etc. We talk a lot about reflexivity and knowledge production and power, but how can we bring our ideas into a wider public beyond academia? So, as you all know, you all know, I think, countless examples which be a witness to this encompassing solidarity of European state and its people with refugees fleeing Ukraine. So people sent money or goods to refugees in Poland, civil society initiatives in support of the refugees are mushrooming, and many opened their private homes to host refugees. The EU introduced a temporary protection directive and similarly Switzerland activated a temporary permit which has been created after the wars in former Yugoslavia but it was never actually activated before. You have also railway companies like the Swiss one who offer travel for free for refugees from the Ukraine, also something we've never seen. While civil society, of course, has initiated manifold actions of solidarity on multiple occasions before in 2015, but even earlier during the wars in former Yugoslavia, for instance, this time states, universities, and private companies support the refugees. And I think we can, of course, partly understand this high solidarity by the immediacy of the war and the tragedies we witness every day. But also among refugee scholars and migration scholars, it's quite a well-known pattern that neighboring countries generally host a big share of refugees. And this is the case, of course, predominantly in the so-called global south. Yet we also can depict these important double standards which are currently at stake and which lead to this highly unequal treatment between different refugee groups. And in my eyes, a first piece in understanding this puzzle of this sudden all-encompassing solidarity is that Ukrainians are very much staged in public discourse as Europeans. So illustrative are, for instance, the word of Philippe Gourbet, which is the head of the political service of a French TV chain, who said, I quote, they're not Syrians, but refugees who look like us. We are talking about Europeans who are living in the cars that look like our cars and who are just tra trying to save their lives, end of quote. Yes, of course, who is considered as European and therefore as being like us and belonging to us is nothing which would be natural or correspond to a set of allegedly objective given set of cultural or phenotypical attributes, culture as much as race or social constructs, as we all know. Rather, it's a question of geopolitics, of historical legacies, of boundary work, categorization, and related to politics of power. In other words, staging Ukrainians as white, as white European refugees who look like us reinforces feeling of membership and solidarity within Europe, as many people still relate to this, while simultaneously establishing a hierarchy and excluding non-white refugees who are a priori considered as non-European. 
But I think there are also traces of the former Cold War narrative, which was based on a moral and geopolitical hierarchization between the West, Europe, and the evil other, the East or Soviet Union. And Putin's invasion of Ukraine revived this narrative, which is, I think, really illustrated by the many allusions we have from politicians between the invasion into the Ukraine and the 1961 of Hungary and 1968 of Czechoslovakia. And in this derived narrative, Ukrainians belong to us, the European, while actually quite ironically, during the Cold War, Ukraine was part of the other. I mean, like, uh, the, I think it's important always to see how these categories are constructed. And as it becomes clear, this representation of Ukrainians as Europeans puts issues under a magnifying glass, which have been noted before by many scholars and which are related, for instance, to the colonial legacies of the European asylum system, as Ulrike Klaus had recently showed very nicely, or more general to global hierarchies and ideologies of Western dominance, which present Europe as superior to the rest of the world. A correspondent at CBS News apologized in the New York Post after he said on air that the war in Ukraine can't be compared to those in Iraq or Afghanistan because the Eastern European nation is more civilized. And he was reporting from Kiev and stating that Ukraine, I quote, isn't a place with all due respect like Iraq or Afghanistan that has seen conflicting, conflicting raging for decades. This is a relatively civilized, relatively European city where you wouldn't expect that or hope that it's going to happen end of quote. Beyond the racist and historically inaccurate character of this intervention, this quote points also to a shift in view of the opposition between us and them from nationalism to what Brubaker called civilizationism. So this idea of a civilizational threat from Islam gave rise to a kind of identitarian Christianism and a secularist posture, which I think could be interpreted as a twist of all the established Orientalist representation. And indeed, Spanish Vox Party leader said it quite bluntly. Anyone can understand the difference, I quote, anyone can understand the difference between these flows and the invasion of young military age males of Muslim origin that have been launched against Europe borders, end of quote. So this hierarchization and double standards become also evident in the many witnesses who reported racial profiling in view of the refugees crossing the border to Poland, like refugees were at times pushed back at the border. As Elspeta Gociak states, the violence of racialized, racialized boundary work between deserving and undeserving refugees crystallized at the Polish-Ukrainian border and even more, of course, at the polish belarusian border. So the immediate danger to which the population in the Ukraine is subjected to is discursively instrumentalized to reinforce this boundary between deserving and undeserving refugees. As could be read in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung, which is just a big journal in Switzerland, quote, they are real refugees these times. We see the suffering of these people. It's different with many migrants who came to Europe in the past as supposed refugees, end of quote. The reasons any other refugees might have for deposing an asylum claim in Europe are discredited by this simple and inaccurate opposition. Additionally, of course, this narrative of the true and deserving refugee is highly gendered and anchored in a nationalist logic. In the same article in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung, we can read, I quote, while the men in Kharkiv and Kiev are fighting for their homeland and making sure their wives and children get to safety, in earlier years, it was striking often young men who came to Europe from other continents. They left the families behind, end of quote. Many scholars have pointed to the ways nationalism and the nation state logic bring up particular constructions of masculinities and femininities. And one of them is the male hero who defends his mother or fatherland. As Leandra Bayes, a political scientist, states, male bodies are used as weapon in war. This nationalist gender narrative is again mobilized to discredit other male refugees who flee from other contexts, which might have other, other, uh, other, the other contexts with other, I don't know what, if they are in other contexts. 
Furthermore, one of the strongest narratives Europe witnesses these last decennies, the one about Muslim refugees as a threat to security, as terrorists, as violent towards our women, as been shown by many scholars. And this clashing discursive constructions, so the refugee male hero versus the refugee male villain, creates again a double standard and can be considered as another facet of the construction of undeservingness of other refugees. And there are, of course, many other aspects which could be mentioned here, but I would like to make a kind of a twist and change the analytical dimension by asking some questions which, which concern us as researchers. So my first question is actually, we could we, with our work we're doing every, every day, support this encompassing solidarity toward Ukrainian refugees without introducing these double standards? In other words, can our work as social scientists contribute or are we rather waiting for ourselves to put it a bit bluntly second i know that i know that many of us we are trying to take a voice in this situation discussing with politicians giving interviews in radio on tv station and also the issue of knowledge production the reflexivity or the question of uh, eurocentric system of knowledge and power became more and more established, at least in some academic fields. In others, I think they are still not established. Yes, yet in spite of this, in a way we still have not really succeeded or partly or maybe only partially seems to me to anchor these ideas also in a wider public. Or put it differently, what would it need that we as researchers can really bring up alternative narratives beyond nationalist, civilizationist, and racist ones about refugees or migrants or non-migrants, but outside of academia. And it seems to me that we have here additionally a kind of a paradox which we confronted with. At least in Europe, migration studies developed, as it has often been pointed to, in very close interaction with migration policy. And at times, this has been brought up actually as a reason why migration scholars simply reproduce quite uncritically political and normative categories, also nation state categories and other hegemonic categories. So we had this kind of migration studies, which was or still is closely entangled with policy making and policy field, but which was perceived as very much of a problematic character. Well, I think we can do commissioned research, also policy research, without reproducing problematic category. But I think this was always a, let's say, a complicated relationship between migration scholars and th those who are doing really this kind of policy research. So in contrast, today, we have all this groundbreaking work showing how migration studies run the risk of reproducing hegemonic uh, structures by reproducing nation state or other categories. But the, I feel like there is a, a kind of a space between these, these different debates, which actually has been growing. Uh, for me, the question really is, how can we bring back this idea into politics, in media, or also in, in larger public spaces? I do, of course, not have clear-cut answers to these questions, but it seems to me that one of the efforts we really need also to do is to tackle not only change when it comes to knowledge production within academia. I mean, there's still a lot to do there. I, I, I definitely think so. But I think we should also put our efforts in trying to think how can we bring these ideas again much closer out to people outside of the academia. And um, maybe just a last point, uh, uh, this how, <laughs> maybe one possible road we might could go, and there probably are others, would be to engage more in engaged scholarship or in participative research object, research projects, which also, of course, goes together with, with other epistemological approaches. But then I'm not talking only about engaged scholarship or participative research with refugees or migrants. There is a great deal of, of good work done in this field. But I think we should also work together with people, I would say, in power, 
in the system, like politicians, stakeholders in the field of so-called integration and migration, street travel bureaucrats, etc. So I think to kind of also tackle those who create by their categories these forms of exclusion and trying to really work in different ways together with them. And with this, I, I will finish. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Janine, for that very compelling talk. And I think very provocative in terms, I really like how it also invokes the practical questions, which so many of us are grappling with. And I, I, I trust it's going to open up a conversation, particularly in this space where we are actually having the webinar, where um, uh, these kinds of uh, this kind of work is also being done, and people are trying to think about how to engage uh, through through research into questions of policy, while also, I, I, I presume, um, um, dealing with some of these issues around uh, perpetrating inequality and um, or reinforcing hierarchies. So thank you. And I, I did note that I hadn't um, men mentioned your, your biography. So uh, in, transi in transitioning to, ma to Martina, I will um, just briefly state um, um, that uh, Janine is a professor of transnational studies and interest who's interested in understanding processes of mig migration, mobility, transnationalization and boundary making and their concomitant production of inequalities linked to ethnicity, race, class, religion, and gender. So thank you so much, Janine. We'll now move over to our second speaker, uh, who is uh, Martina. And I'm very excited to listen to Martina, whose work is at the crossroad of uh, critical overall, um, which, sorry, uh, at the crossroad uh, of, of critical work that explores the biopolitical mechanisms uh, by which subjects, some, some subjects are racialized and governed as migrants by analyzing the intertwining of modes of objectivation and subjectivities. And she's recently been engaged in um, investigating technologi technologization of the border regime and how technologies constitute a battlefield for migrant states and non-state actors. Over to you, Martina. Thank you. Thank you so much, first of all, for the invitation. And as it has been mentioned, what I present today is the result of a collaborative work with my colleague and friend, Stefan Schill, who today, unfortunately, uh, cannot make it. So this is a paper that is forthcoming and is entitled, Who is a Migrant? Challenging the National State Point of View in the Study of Migration. So it's very much related to what Janine just discussed. And I think, I mean, I... I also agree with her um, about this point of this need of bridging or better bringing back this critical analysis about uh, the production of knowledge in migration studies to the field of politics. So I will spend a few words towards the end about this. Um, and I will summarize the main um, idea of the paper. Uh, and in the second part, I will also add some new points that, that stem from more recent work about the technologization of migration governance and what it means uh, nowadays to produce a critical knowledge uh, about this um, without reproducing a state-based uh, gaze uh, on migration and on the technologization uh, of the border regime. And this paper is the result of a long, um, let's say, journey that we started when we uh, did our uh, PhD, uh, and that the, I would say the main um, drive at the moment was to interrogate how to, what does it mean to elaborate, to craft a critical knowledge about the border regime without narrowing uh, this critique to the production of evidence and disposure of evidence about states' violation of human rights. So confronted to this in past, right? That more evidence, even if it's absolutely necessary to produce evidence about this violation, state's violation, this is no longer sufficient for um, triggering some change and also triggering so like uh, citizen mobilization. So um, in this paper, um, which is forthcoming in the journal Migration Politics, we advance an alternative definition of a migrant that abandon ways of seeing migration like a state and embrace the perspective of mobility and more precisely of the struggle that those who are labeled and racialized as migrants are forced to do in order to remain in a place, to move on as well as to access rights. So in the paper, we, we pay attention in not 
flattening uh, our understanding of migration onto movements and even less into like border crossing, the crossing of uh, international borders. Um, so our analysis is grounded in the materiality of the struggle that those who are governed and labeled as migrants carry on. And however, when I say struggle, I'm not referring, uh, or at least I'm not referring only to the to deliberate challenges to the border regime and so to collective mobilization, migrant struggles, um, but rather to struggle for staying and for moving independently of the willingness of the people uh, to struggle, right? So our analysis is informed by um, the, the autonomy of migration literature, but as I will explain in a minute, uh, also take some uh, I mean, distance from it and put at the core what we call the making of migration, that is the administrative, socioeconomic and legal mechanism by which some people are turned and into migrants and covered accordingly. So we understand a migrant as a person who in order to move or to stay in a desired place has to struggle against bordering practices or better racializing bordering practices and processes of boundary making that are implicated by the national order of things. So this definition adopt uh, the perspective of mobility and puts uh, Sandra Mezzadra and Brett Nielsen define as border struggles at the center of the analysis. However, by proposing to adopt the perspective of mobility in the definition of my migrants, we neither want to erase the multiplicity of migrant condition, nor do we want to suggest that there is a single migrant perspective. This is for us very important reason why we, um, draw, we draw attention to, as I said, the materiality of the struggles. And we think that the challenge consists precisely in taking into account and building on this heterogeneity of migrant condition. In fact, we start analysis with a border struggle and ask who is enacted as a migrant. So who is a migrant here and now uh, in a certain, uh, in a particular situation? Um, so in this sense, migration emerges something that on the one hand is contingent, relational and multiple. And on the other, however, is also part. So who is uh, produced as a migrant is partly, of course, the result also of a sedimented um, um, uh, racialized practices that uh, persist and of course also partly change over time and differ from space to space. So who is uh, migrantized, who is perceived and labeled as a migrant in Italy, mm, uh, this has changed over time, but at the same time there has been a, a certain continuity and this differs partly from other countries from us. Thus the focus on migrant, board, on migrant border struggle as a key element of our definition highlights that there are a myriad of ways to be migrants and that there exists consequently only a plurality of migrant perspective. So um, if you want, even if we radically challenge in the paper a way of um, seeing migration like a state, uh, and so we call for abandoning the nation state perspective, we don't think that it's so automatic to, I mean, to shift the, the, the focus methodologically and to just seeing like a migrant. What does it mean to seeing like a migrant? We don't uh, understand this in abstract term or as a, an abstract positionality that reproduce a solid category uh, in sociological terms, but precisely that accounts for this uh, multiplicity. So, and in this way, and this is our second objective, our definition challenges the decentralization and the historicization of migrants as staple sociological categories. Adopting the perspective of mobility in the study of migration fractures the category of the migrant while also putting it on the move. Starting from the observation that the term migrant is a stigmatizing label that problematizes the mobility or the residency of people designated as such, in the paper we investigate the implication of nation state center conception of migration, which define migration as a movement from nation state A to nation state B. And of course, we also take into account also the, all the nuances, right? And the, uh, differences um, in which this kind of definition implicitly uh, underpins many understanding, both at the level of political debate and academic and, and in academia of who is a migrant, uh, even if sometimes this is not the intention, right? But how this methodological nationalism uh, is somehow underpins uh, most of the knowledge production of migration. So by asking who is a migrant in Europe today, we show that nation state center understanding of migration rests on a deeply entrenched methodological nationalism and implicate three epistemological traps that continue to shape much of research on migration. 
First, the naturalization of the international national state order that results secondly in the ontologization of migrants as ready available object of research while facilitating, and this is the third point, the framing of migration as a problem of government. And so we uh, call to undo this link between this nexus between migration and government and looking at migration as a problem, although this doesn't mean uh, disregarding uh, or dismissing the import as what Janine indeed uh, just uh, mentioned, and I fully agree of, um, I mean, bringing our uh, research outside academia and um, and not, and, and avoiding to engage, right, with the public debate, absolutely not. Uh, but is uh, framing uh, framing our intervention or better our gaze on migration, uh, supporting, endorsing this view of migration as a problem. Um, so the national state point of view on migration informed policy making as well as statistical and academic knowledge production on migration, um, and, as, and also the thinking of wider publics about migration. Following Bridget Anderson, migration signifies, in fact, problematic mobility. Accordingly, I quote, not all mobility is subject to scrutiny, but migration already signals the need for control and in public discourses of race and class. Since migration, and in particular the mobility of the poor, is regulated through laws on citizenship and nor by notion of national belonging, the historical and geographically contingent problematization of the mobility and presence of some people as migration can be used as an analytical lens to study transformation in migration politics and related borders and citizenship regime. Hence, Anderson called for, I quote, the problematization of migration in a tool for inquiry. And, um, and, in, and in the paper we discuss, uh, as I said, this definition of migration beyond border crossing that uh, to some extent um, still um, still characterize also critical migration scholarship and also the autonomy of migration literature uh, that I just mentioned. And uh, we look at how the condition of migrant in this plurality um, uh, sometimes is not related to mobility, but is, is very much related also to the nationality law or of each country and to the potential or actually legalization of some people who never cross the border. So um, uh, without, I mean, going in detail, we, uh, we focus on three um, quite different examples in the paper to, uh, to highlight the wide variety of practices of migrantization, precisely to show this heterogeneity. And we look at the Schengen visa regime of the European Union, the integration paradigm, and the bordering of Europe's southern frontier in the Mediterranean. Um, so, what is important for us is that unlike uh, literature that um, uh, propose uh, the migrant as the paradigmatic figure of the present, so that seeing like a migrant becomes this abstract uh, uh, way, right? This abstract positionality. Um, we, as I said, ground that our definition, we pay attention to uh, the materiality of the struggle and to the historical uh, dimension. Um, <clears throat> So we need to, we call uh, for bringing attention to what is invisibilized by state-centered conception of migration. Um, the practice of bordering through which nation state constitute and govern some people as migrants in order to re reproduce themselves as territorially bounded, culturally distinct imagined communities. We therefore propose to invent as suggested also by other scholars such as Barak Khalil or Tukba Bazaran and Elspeth Gai, the nation state center perspective of status conception of migration. But in contrast to them, we place the practices of bordering through which nation states employ to govern some people as migrants center stage. We achieve this by taking part in inspiration, as I said, from the autonomy of migration literature, which call on scholars to investigate contemporary border migration and citizenship regime from migrants perspective. So the autonomy of migration central hypothesis, as probably most of you know, attributes moment of autonomy, that is moments of uncontrollability and access to migra migratory, pra migratory practices and movement. However, autonomy of migration scholars have so far not sufficiently considered the implication that the inversion of the state center perspective as for the conception of who is a migrant and also this heterogeneity of, as I said, of condition experiences of migration, which uh, cannot be conflated and reduced to a moment of mobility and uh, border crossing. 
So to undo state is understanding of migration is therefore key to first interrogate who is racialized as a migrant here and now, and to account for the fact that people are enacted as migrant in geographically varying and temporally contingent way. So going towards the conclusion, racializing bordering practices of nation state cannot however be taken as isolated self-standing object of critique. On the contrary, when studying the process of migrantization, we should also explore how the national order of things is situated within a geopolitical context characterized by profound asymmetries in terms of access to mobility. And how this is also shaped in form by, of course, class, gender, and race uh, forms of discrimination. So um, learning not to see like a state is ultimately the primary endeavor that the analytical lens of migration invites us to engage in. And also in order to, as I said, it becomes, it can be mobilized analytical lens for rethinking also other categories uh, which are central in political theory and also uh, to address uh, the multiplication of degrees of non, of non citizenship. Uh, and as I said, I wanted to add a couple of points that are not part of the paper, but that for me are relevant to the debate. Uh, as I said, the first, uh, it was the, the drive of the paper, which is, how to rethink critique uh, beyond the production of evidence and exposure of border violence. So this uh, uh, methodological shift for, for us is also a way to, um, uh, to, to start look, crafting uh, our critical analysis differently. For instance, to give a concrete example, uh, in current the burgeoning literature on uh, technologization of the border regime, there is a tendency to uh, um, even involuntarily repropose uh, a state gaze on migration by asking uh, to what extent can we govern migrants, refugees better, and to what extent technology can, um, uh, in, um, can be a risk, danger for migrants, or can help streamlining humanitarian support and empower migrants. So reproposing this state gaze approach. While if we shift attention and investigate through also empirical research, um, the extent to which and in which way technology uh, generate harms on migrants. And sometimes it's not the same harm that we think that we might take for granted, like, I don't know, uh, by privacy violation or uh, surveillance, right? This is the citizen gaze on uh, how migrants are affected by technology, but can be, for instance, the multiple obstruction which are enforced through this um, uh, mandatory uh, technological intermediation that asylum seekers, for instance, face in many refugee camps. So it's not just to say this is for me not just an abstract move, but is related to how uh, we can uh, look at the problem differently and also understand for also for the purpose of political debates, which kind, where we should situate the critique or also a constructive engagement with politicians. Um, so I agree that it's not a question of choosing between either critique, uh, theoretical critique of the border regime or policy making, but to help uh, recrafting uh, the debate uh, under a different light. So that doesn't accept the assumption uh, on the basis of which the racialization of some is uh, persists in, and is replicated. I will stop here. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Martina, for that very rich and um, I think um, well positioned, I think, in terms of how it speaks as well to Janine's uh, input. And I think we have ourselves as well uh, an interesting conversation that could emerge, I think, between these two papers. So um, I'm going to now move on to myself and present my own paper on uh, um, decolonizing African migration uh, research. And um, in this paper, I think I am also coming from a perspective where I um, I'm really taking task with, um, sorry, I'm just taking note of the time. There we go, okay. So I'm, in, in my paper, I'm trying to really take task with some of the media representations of African refugees and asylum seekers, um, associating them with threats or did some depictions of them as um, particularly miserable individuals who are trying to maybe cross the Mediterranean into Europe. 
Um, there's also mi migration policies that readily draw on normative concepts such as safe, orderly, regular migration, um, which uh, add on to already established ideals such as integration that are really <laughs> problematized in conversations around even the global compacts if you if you're sitting in a space around policy making you would you would you would really think that these 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 concepts are readily made and uh and ripe for for migrants to to uh to accept and also to benefit from and there's also a lot of as we know approaches to addressing root causes of migration through research and humanitarian interventions which are mostly funded by institutions in the global north and these really uh, address the political causes of black african people's oppression and the global positioning of african migration to europe as more significant is also one of uh, one of the issues that I think the point of departure for my input um, and my, my in, in this sense um, we've seen also how migration studies has become increasingly interested in uh, decolonial perspectives and skeletally skillet, defined the decolonization is uh, to draw on the uh, work by Gopal 2021 is the process which signifies the end of rule by a foreign power and the recuperation and formation of an independent entity, usually a nation state, through a process referred to as a transfer of power. But then I think coloniality as a concept in general goes beyond reading power in the formal sense, at least from this definition, to seeing it more as a long standing pattern or at least as some kind of a, tem a temporality. Uh, or as Bakhtun would perhaps call it a, a chronotope and in terms of how it is, um, it, it, it is longstanding and it emerged as a result of colonialism, but it continues to define culture, uh, labor and intersubjective relations, as well as knowledge production. Um, so in this sense, we're, we're really talking about how um, relations that are colonial in a sense continue beyond the long formal ending of colonial rule in, in, in our everyday experiences and the way i perceive decolonization is is uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a struggle against coloniality rather than necessarily direct colonialism um, which uh, expresses a fight for a radically transformed future by undoing some of the temporal impacts of colonialism that are embedded in modernity. And modernity itself is colonial in the sense that it, it seeks to constitute a, glo a globalized subject while remaining oblivious to some of the historical forces and constraints that constitute others differently. So in this way, it erases historical or seeks to erase historical inequality. And we're urged in this world to always look forward uh, to this worldly future as Thurban calls it, which is open, novel, reachable, or constructible. And we, and, and we see the present as a possible preparation towards this future. And the past is, um, some, is, 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 is put out as something to leave behind or as a heap of ruins uh, or pieces of which might be used for building a new future. So in this paper, drawing on this um, conception of the idea of decoloniality, I would like to maybe present a critique of approaches to decolonizing the field, um, particularly where I'm situated in Africa. And my critique is that um, there's a tendency to treat sort of the efforts towards what decentering and recentering migration studies as distinct rather than constitutive processes towards the epistemic decolonization of migration theory and praxis. So I would like to expand on exist, pre-existing critiques of migration studies. So it's not really something new that I bring, but rather an expansion of critiques of nation states, borders, some of these constructs of progress, development, logics of integration. And I, and I argue that the idea of a chronopolitics or the politics of time can be a, a, a heuristic, at least theoretically. And I suppose we can always think about how that can be supplanted into realms of practice uh, for a uh, decolonial migration uh, that justifiably recenters Africa to the point that the, it can carry forward the decentering efforts needed for doing away with labeling people who cross the Mediterranean as well as internal regional borders as migrants. <clears throat> 
And I think this is important because as my immigration is, is starting to play or continue to play a powerful role in shaping European imaginations of threat and continuities of racial and colonial violence through dehumanizing black migrant uh, migrant bodies. So in this, I, my, my idea of decolonizing migration studies is firmly grounded in the reading of acts of the, these people occupying white neoliberal and Western geographic and intellectual spaces that were never created for them as an act of resistance against systems of power. And this crowding relies, um, as some have already done in this session, on a historicized interpretation of what African migration signifies for Black African migration scholars and more importantly, Black Africans on the move by reframing Europe's conception of itself as an innocent bystander, which allows us to imagine a world where it is possible for Black African migration scholars to realize better representation and dictate the tune of intellectual exchange, set the agenda of migration studies while justifiably addressing the concerns of vulnerable local uh, participants and breaking away from methodological nationalism and the migrantization of African research altogether. And existing approaches have tried to think about uh, a decolonial migration research agenda in Africa uh, in, um, uh, and uh, through a conversation about whether it entails the decentering of the of global north knowledge or recentering the south. And the decentering of global north knowledge cons would consist conducting research and practice that breaks away from the category of migrant as the basic unit, unit of analysis and practice, as I interpreted at least through processes such as demigrantization uh, that uh, Dahind in 2016 would call, um, or escaping borders as scholars like Zovo Gacheni, and as well Myron Nakenjeri's idea or drawing on Wema and Sheila's uh, concept of methodological nationalism. And at its most radical, it would entail breaking away from the migra migration lens towards a mobility focus. And whereas recentering the South in the, in the lingo of Ngugi um, Wationgo would suggest the need to shift the locus of power from the global North to the South and allow Southern based scholars to shape Southern theories and epistemologies, as well as define their own terms of engagement with local communities about what it is that constitutes knowledge. So essentially it is about putting Africa at the center in relation to other spaces and forms of knowledge. Um, it is about critical reflexivity, um, shifting the gaze to humanitarian institutions, Southern ethnography, adopting participatory methods or, or artistic production. These are some of the ways that have been fronted as some of the uh, possible avenues to achieve this. However, Recentering does not explicitly pay attention to local power asymmetries, which explains why uh, participatory methods have often been criticized. And to draw on the Danowitz 2017 paper, um, these discourses of inclusion reproduce the starting premise of white nationalism, namely that migrants are strangers. Uh, charitable subjects and uninvited guests. So in, in some ways, we what we tend to hyper -vis -vis visibilize the other in, in doing some of this kind of work. And in my own observation, the debate in the field has become an oppositional, at least interaction of an either or relationship of these two aspects to the point that decolonization in the field is not necessarily well uh, articulated. But one of the things that comes to mind in my in my head, there's a question is whether it's tenable to simply decenter without recentering or vice versa. And I argue that both are constitutive and any uh, decolonizing or transformative migration research agenda should be as such for there is a great utility in attending to both in tandem by creating necessary local conditions that allow for emergence of a black critical mass, mass and centers of power through critical engagement with race and representation that can in turn carry forward a concerted agenda to decenter the field by breaking with the Eurocentric categories of migrant and nation state as the basic unit of analysis. So in, my, in other words, if we are to ever see a day where we say, let's move towards a mobility uh, approach and, and, and do all together away with the idea of migrantization, um, they would need 
that would need to be accompanied in, by structural and more concerted and holistic uh, uh, question, um, issues of transformation. And I think the confusion in the field sometimes emerges from preoccupations of centering, of recentering without decentering, and vice versa, based on an evasion uh, uh, of critiques of each. Uh, yet these criticism are, uh, um, uh, criticisms are relational, as they mainly apply to interventions by white European scholars. And I, I would say they either fall away or become justifiably deferred if a chronal politi political chronopolitical optic that places black bodies at the center of the agenda is adopted. For example, going back to Danovid's work, one of the critiques of uh, post-structural post-structuralist theory, which I think gives credence to some of to the value of recentering as an approach, um, is that it allows the white subject to reconstitute itself as ethical and good, innocent of its imperialist histories and present complicities which within this line of thinking would be conceivable to follow that such an approach, a chronopolitical approach would allow more room for black African migration scholars to justifiably incorporate a struggle to protect and offer political resistance for endangered others. Um, hence it is unpro unproductive to break with the field and its reference without achieving this full representation, which would then in turn give the opportunity for, for, for them to reshape their own knowledge and the responsibility and capacity to protect um, endangered migrant communities while pursuing longer term approaches that allow them to do so uh, themselves. And uh, similar problems related to sort of these questions of white innocence would still confront a decentered field. So if uh, a case that gives immunity, if we could call it that, to Black, black African scholars of migration from some of these criticisms of recentering that are often directed to the position of a white European scholar, um, then, the, um, then the duality of decolonization as a process of both recentering and decentering becomes more tenable. And so in, in essence, the chronopolitical approach to, uh, gives some kind of um, long, some kind of immunity around some of these questions from criticisms about the relation, re relationality with the center in order to realize a baseline of for more radical transformation to occur in the context where there's so much disparity between, between these two contexts, especially uh, in light of the intellectual and political denial of the constitutive role of uh, European colonialism and slavery. And this is somewhat to uh, what uh, Casey et al. 2020 call uh, re relational decolonization, which they argue, I quote, requires white and European scholars to do extra work to catch up with African led debates, indigenous knowledge processes, and public discourses for the purposes of listening and dialogue, not commodification or co optation. It requires both creating space for and seeding space to scholars from excluded and marginalized communities, whether they've been marginalized due to gendered, racialized, epistemic, religious, ethno-linguistic, or embodied hierarchies. So in a sense, this could also apply to any other position of power, I suppose, uh, as I'm speaking from my position, this, this is the, what it would entail, but it could be a conversation that would uh, be had around some of the questions of gender and race and religion and ethnicity. And to in, allow me to then briefly to reflect a little on this question of responsibility and re relationality and the kind of immunity I'm referring to in relation to an experience that reflects the problem faced by Black African migration scholars who are seeking to uh, find themselves in the field and also to find some kind of transformation. And, and in some ways, it, it has also become convenient ammunition for lurking detractors, as I would call them. So this pre my preoccupation with chronopolitics as a possible heuristic came around May 2018 when I was attending an international conference on migration and health in Edinburgh. And there, I had conversations with colleagues um, and there was what I called some kind of ontological pain of seeing that certain things were not okay around the visibility for room for Black African migration scholars to speak about it themselves. So you create a space to talk about African migration, but you don't have uh, those people to actually do this themselves. And when in those rare instances where such work was presented, it would be articulated um, in ways that were very um, biased. 
um, that in, in occupying this that space, I was also feeling as if the world is saying to me, you know, you have no right to complain. You may be black, but you're here. You're not in a shack somewhere in Africa. And this is the, the ambivalence of being a black scholar in largely white spaces, which epitomizes what Kilomba terms the danger of being from the margins and speaking at the center. And this burden is not unique to migration studies scholars alone, but it's a generic uh, experience of all black scholars, which makes uh, them feel bad for attaining the basic right to mobility that gives them a passport to convey African perspectives after tumultuous and uh, degrading visa experiences, um, yet which are things that so many white people enjoy uh, to a point where then it comes to feel like a privilege, especially in a context where the black majority are relatively worse off. The same logic would apply for black people who occupy tenured academic positions who may begin to get closer to the center to the point where their proximity would risk giving credence to voices opposed to decolonization in the name of their own capability for in producing and upholding the system. So the oppressive work this uh, burden does is peddle the idea that Black African scholars should be uh, cautious of demanding too much transformation because they're ostensibly part of the systemic problem. And uh, as such, they request to recenter uh, nothing more than a self-serving act. And this easily becomes a rhetoric of silence, silencing them, even though we know fully well that there is a threshold of change that can be realized, what others have called. Uh, structural decolonization. But this can only take place if they're given the opportunity and left to reflect on their relative privilege in ways that allow them to locate and position themselves within the academy and decolonial struggle. And while these spaces were not created when, with Black people in mind, they can, still, they can still reclaim their stolen potentialities by redefining their struggles and exploring non-Eurocentric knowledge and ensuring that there is uh, better representation. So in closing, I would like to argue that um, there's a real danger that uh, the conversation would collapse when, it come, when, it, when it's read in, in, in isolation. Uh, and there's also a conversation that um, re only reproduces hierarchies in the global South without necessarily giving uh, Black African mig migration scholars uh, space, which in itself affirms their colonial idea that they, they cannot be in control of their own destinies uh, and negates their relationality with white people, placing them in power on the basis of their profession. So while valid, some of these uh, critical focus would be belies the existence of well-intentioned efforts and other temporal meanings of recentering, such as how it could also capture the directionality of migration, such that decolonial position is read as chronopolitical. So in closing, perhaps, I would say perhaps heeding decolonization is a kind of chronopolitics, at least in the context of migration, could uh, erase or minimize the coloniality reinvigorated in the silencing of attempts to recenter the, the field, which is often done in the name of possible uh, nativism. Thank you. All right, so I will now, I think we're now open to questions. Um, and then um, I, I'm aware that Janine has to uh, also leave because of other commitments a bit earlier. So Janine, for all the questions, you, you would take the first uh, floor. And then also for everyone, if you could get your questions coming in, um, we would really appreciate that so that we can have a discussion in response to these papers. Um, and. Um, yeah, so I think I'm going to open up with this first question that's been posed. And for the panelists, let's all free, feel free to also maybe bring to in uh, each other in conversation. I think there was a conversation about this idea of what it means, what this all means for the policy space, right? Is it a question of still using that same, occupying that same space, um, you know, the migration sort of studies space? And, and, and finding ways of bridging the gap, or is it about pushing away from it all, all, all together? Um, so I think there was an interesting conversation um, happening between uh, Janine and, um, and Martina. So I would encourage you to also um, keep that going. So the question from Andrew Fallon is uh, for Dr. Vanyora and Dr. 
Tazioli, ethnography is often seen as a way to emphasize people's lived experiences, yet how should you also employ quantitative methods in the decolonial migration research? I'll uh, we'll hand over to Martina for that, so that I can also just uh, maybe uh, catch a bit of a breath, break. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, I would say, which I mean, I'm, I I don't use quantitative methods personally, but I think that the the answer is we should probably de seize the opportunity to decolonize quantitative methods in the sense that, of course. Um, well, I think that um, the, the politics of number, first of all, is always politically sl is slippery in the sense that also um, turning uh, the argument, the state's argument upside down, for instance, and demonstrating that there is not something like a migrant invasion and so on uh, can be slippery because, of course, then it depends how we use this number, right? Because it's a, it can be used for saying, okay, but is anyway is still... Uh, uh, is still a lot, is still enough, right? So I think I'm always, I have, I'm always, um, um, I have doubts about mobilizing numbers for uh, turning against states, um, I mean, uh, racist uh, politics and so on. But at the same time, I think it's important in terms of critical knowledge production to unveil, to unpack, to uh, show how uh, these statistics are, uh, produced, right? For instance, about not only I mean, migrant arrivals, about asylum applications, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is um, so to to show that not not to take. Uh, I mean, uh, highlighting uh, uh, the, the the way in which these numbers have been produced and what is left out of these statistics and what how these statistics are the result of a specific way of crafting uh, the problem. Um, then I think that, I mean, there, there are uh, specific, I, I, don't, I, I don't think we can provide a general answer, but there are specific contexts in which building on quantitative methods can be helpful for uh, showing, for instance, uh, the, the, the degree of, for um, uh, rate of, for instance, the, the fact that the, the, the asylum system in Europe is kind of collapsing and so that the, the, the number, the rate of success of asylum applicants uh, in some countries in particular has decreased, has dropped a lot uh, in comparison uh, to uh, the asylum application uh, outside Europe, this can be helpful. But for me, uh, this depends how we use these counter arguments in terms of numbers while definitely decolonizing and showing uh, how these numbers have been constructed and not taking this data collection uh, as a neutral factor is part of a decolonizing approach to migration studies. Thanks a lot, Martina, for that. I, I, I really think that's useful. And um, building on your response, I would say I, it's a question I haven't really uh, necessarily thought because I'm like my, like yourself, I'm not necessarily a quantitative researcher. But some of the cues I've probably taken over the years is some of the observations maybe around, maybe it's, there's a question around reflexivity about, you know, when it's okay or ethical or responsible to sort of play that numbers game or not. And maybe that's as far as I can think in terms of this idea of maybe there's a degree of reflexivity that needs to go with uh, with that kind of work. Because um, for one of the things I always am wary of is, for example, when we argue that, well, migration from Africa is not as significant, to Europe is not as significant, what is it that we are saying though about this idea of um, um, pe people's humanity and and why why they should be taken in? You, you, there's, 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 there's some seems there like a rationale to say I'm going to show the policymaker that the, these people are not necessarily as many enough to warrant us worrying about the flood. You know, so in some ways you're still you know whether you like it or not. They, 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 there's still an index, right? Something behind that that says that 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 rationalizes why you would, as a researcher, need to go and and mention some of these numbers um, as a qualification. I think that 
what would would amount to some some kind of a transformative thing is where whether there was one million or two million or five million or ten million or five we we would need to have a conversation about how protection how they go how these migrants or how these asylum seekers are going to be protected um so for me that 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 would be maybe the one area to trade with caution and i think the second area would have to do with just being cautious when there's rejection rates as well when you are showing that indeed maybe the asylum seek system is not working sometimes that can back be a backlash against in our context where certain groups are seen as economic migrants who are using the the asylum system as like a uh, a second door to try and get into the country and find work it could also be easily interpreted as a a confirmation that indeed there are so many people who are doing it particularly to 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 the to the uh, to the uh, regular citizens who are not necessarily too acquainted so i think it's just really about giving more thoughts to why we're doing what we're doing with the numbers uh, i don't know if janine you have anything to add while i then look at this other question Actually, I would just very shortly to answer what both of you just said, because I think it's quite an interesting question, the one with, with, with numbers. Because uh, not ju just in view of rejection rates or, what, or flows, but also, I mean, statistics basically migrantize and racialize people, basically. And this is, I think, done differently in each country. Like in Switzerland, we have the categories of foreigners of migration background. In UK, you have uh, categories of uh, minorities. And I think there is a potential there to really kind of disturb this way of, uh, of categories within statistics. And I think quantitative research did not at all exploit actually the possibility it has to do differently. So why always to categorize along nationality? Why always to categorize? And I think there we really could, uh, it's not just about reflexivity. I really think this could be one way to present the world in a different way. If you use other categories than this kind of categories which produce migrantization, which produce racialization. So I think there is a potential there. Just if you would present in Switzerland totally different the statistics to people, they just would be confused. I mean, this makes people think, you know, you can think it's not very important, but I think uh, there is something very important about categorization. And I'm quite often disappointed why quantitative researchers do not use this potential they have, because in comparison with qualitative researchers, I mean, they can present data according to other variables. They do not need the, the nationality or race or whatever variable. So I really think it could be interesting to, to think about this, how to use quantitative research in pushing forward a decolonial approach, basically. Thank you so much, Janine. I think these are issues that we're all thinking on our toes because I also haven't come across anything. So it does speak to volumes to this idea. And Andrew is, is quite, uh, he said, thank you. I'm similarly skeptical of migration statistics, yet I find myself in need of using greater quantitative methods due to the epistemic bias towards them in evidence-based policymaking. So we will now return to you, Janine, because the question, uh, question here is, is from uh, Leila, and it's about the definition of who is a refugee and she says Ukrainians are now seen as genuine refugees whereas according to the convention which for Geneva convention which focuses on individual persecution they would not be defined as such so maybe she she said she says would be this would be the start of a conversation on how to make the, the refugee convention more fit for the context which could provide support to people who need support as in the case of Ukrainians, but how do we evaluate the potential of these current debates to shift the narrative about the category of who is a refugee? Thanks. Uh, shall I just very short, briefly, maybe say something? Thanks a lot, Lyra, for this question, which is, of course, highly complex. I mean, uh, of course, I mean, you know as well as me that, I mean, it's all this ambivalence, isn't it? So the, the label refugee, is important for governance as well. And this, of course, related to inequalities, related to different forms of exclusion. At the same time, this label also gives access to resources, 
And I mean, there are many debates, as far as I know, currently about the refugee convention and how to enlarge it, how to adapt it to the current systems. And to be very short, I think we maybe should more fundamentally think about this question. I'm not at all saying we should abolish or something the refugee convention, not at all, but I mean, there is all this work showing that also the refugee convention is based on certain assumptions. It was, uh, it's not, I mean, it's a racialized convention in a way, at least at the beginning. I mean, it still is, but, but it took a different twist. So I think, uh, and I think there are scholars doing this kind of, of conversation and doing this kind of reflection. It's because, uh, I mean, just the category of who is a genuine refugee is, of course, uh, a different question. If, how do we want to define this? And could we find other ways to think about these questions in a way? So there are also many people, as you know, thinking about uh, open borders, etc. How would this change? I mean, uh, in we, how far would we still need a refugee convention in this? case. Of course we would, but it would have a totally different status. So I really think this is an excellent question, which, which really would need much more time to discuss, basically. Thank you. Thank you a lot, Janine. Um, so we're left with about four minutes and we're aware of your time. I wanted to ask a question just to, for, for you first, Janine, before you go, and then I will finish it off with Martina. Uh, this, the, you mentioned the idea of the Ukrainian refugee is a um, somewhat this contestation and this is this making of it around some of the history or you know this idea of commonality about how you know how that makes for some kind of ready acceptance and i'm thinking within the african context where um i don't know this this the scholars like tendai achuma who've argued about migration as decolonization who go as far as arguing that because of the sort of colonial system and this idea of um sort of the whole bureaucracy of colonialism it almost seems that it was convenient for the colonial regime to to claim some kind of shared history but at this at this point in time africa is africa and europe is europe do you see some kind of potential in 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 in, in bringing together uh, as, as a narrative to to policymakers or to think about as a way to to sort of sell the idea of uh incorporating africans and not necessarily racializing them and, and because of this you know this the commonwealth all these these things that still exist that relate to this shared history albeit of a more uh contested and and and, and imperfect nature well again i think that's a very thanks a lot for this question but i think it's a very very complex question because as you say there are historical legacies as well which are extremely important and I mean, my, my question would actually be, how is this conflict now perceived in, in African countries? I have no idea how, what, I mean, because what I presented was, of course, from a very much a European perspective. So how is the, I mean, how, is there no solidarity or is there, or are there more these double standards which are kind of discussed? So I, I actually would rather be interested in, in this, that uh, so your question kind of point makes me understand that there, the debate might be very different in other contexts. And I would mm. be interested in this in a way. Yeah. Yeah, I think that this is an interesting, at least at the moment, the conversation or the, the view, the perspective is more of this double standards that you're mentioning to yeah. say, well, look, look at that, you know, like the way I, and also there's like also some double standards in terms of African countries like South Africa who won't necessarily take a position on the conflict to say, because of some of their commercial, of their own economic interests, right? But so far, I think it's, it's really illuminated that there's also the treatment of Black people in Ukraine itself, which is like, the microcosm of like the categories within the category sort of so there's that that's there's that happening as well yeah yeah thanks a lot Kuda. i okay. have to leave so i will right. leave you, but thanks a lot many thanks for this very interesting input from both of you and hope seeing oh. you soon again
Okay, thank you, Janine. Um, and then Martina, I don't know if you have any um, reflections about this conversation we are having. And, and I think there's also a question about, as we wrap it up, it seems from Jean, Jean P, thank you. It seems that decolonization scholarship has been centered on the context of Africa and black people. What do you think Asian experience and context is positioned within it? I don't know if you have any insights on that. Then, then uh, when you give us our, your insight, I'll just wrap up the session. Thank you. Um, I think that in Leila's uh, question is very important yes. um, about uh, the, the, the refugee convention. And that has never been, uh, I mean, has, is not, has, has not been highlighted enough in the public debate that according to the Geneva Convention, even if now these are considered the real, the genuine refugees, actually, according to the convention, they are not. And I see this um, uh, as, a, as, as a potential expansive moment. So that definitely is important to um, account for the racism which is currently going on against the non-white people who are fleeing Ukraine and and also the, what happened months ago at the same border with Poland with the Afghani people but at the same time I think that our analysis cannot stop just there right observing this discrimination and I think that in a moment when the asylum particularly the, the asylum in Europe uh, is in a is shrinking and the, the EU pact on migration and asylum is one of the, uh, the, the, the legal political tools through which this implosion is, is gonna happen. I think that it, it can be turned and it should be uh, seized. In uh, going back to Janine's question about what uh, can we do as um, scholars involved in the production of about migration uh, can, can be and should be a moment of uh, expansive uh, claims so that uh, precisely because of this multiple contradiction among which uh, the, the known um, coincidence between the figure of um, the Ukrainian um, uh, displaced person and the figure of the refugee according to the Geneva Convention and at the same time the fact that however the European Union will be granting temporary protection uh, to Ukrainians only, so this uh, positive, uh, if you want, discrimination uh, should be a way for reconsidering uh, the asylum system as such and for uh, so, I mean, reversing this trend. Um, it, this is, this is uh, I mean, I think is a, I, I might be optimistic and I think is a, too optimistic and I think is a, it is definitely a difficult um, stake. Uh, but this is probably one of the points where, uh, in terms of like critical debates on migration, we should uh, focus on now. Um, and well, I leave to you the question about uh, uh, Asia, uh, even if I fully agree with the person who, who asked the question, uh, that for me is not about reproducing. So the risk mm -hmm. is always to reproduce binary opposition or to mm -hmm. challenge mainstream discourse by simply uh, turning upside down. Um, so I, I fully agree that uh, in, also in this case, uh, we shouldn't just repropose just a standpoint over others. Um, uh, but just to conclude about like the, the, uh, what Janine was saying about the role between um, critical scholars and public debate. And as I said, for me, uh, is not in contradiction the, 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 with, the, with the goal of intervening in the public debate, uh, any methodological attempt to r radically uh, challenge methodological nationalism and the way in which we look at migration as a problem, uh, because this has very concrete uh, consequences in the way in which the public discourse uh, is framed. Yeah, thank you very much. Um... Yeah, I think the, uh, to respond in, in wrapping up this session, I think I'm not necessarily positioned to talk about the, this idea because like I mentioned, I'm talking from my own positionality as in, someone who's located in the African context. And I also stand to be somewhat uh, educated on, um, on thinking about how some of these conversations are reflected in the Asian context. So I wouldn't want to take away from that. And, and it's not necessarily a sort of... Uh, like um, Martina just mentioned, a question of sort of um, simply changing the subject. You know, I couldn't talk about it from the perspective of, of women, for example, as sort of 
let's say decolonizing women's studies, if ever such a thing would have to be uh, a conversation that comes from feminists themselves or in this case, I think the question is how that, you know, if there's any such conversations, how, what are those and what do those look like? And we'd be interested as well in hearing about some of those uh, from you. So Leila, thank you so much for organizing this and putting this interesting panel together. Thanks as all well to our colleagues, um, our technicians who are assisted us so ably to be able to put this together. And thanks for the MPC for uh, creating this space for us. And special thanks to Martina and uh, Janine for being such great panelists. So on that note, we will um, we will wrap it up and uh, keep uh, keep updated on on the what the MP great work MPC is doing on their website. Okay. <laughs>